All right, ladies and gentlemen of Shy Hack Night, the moment you have been waiting for for well nigh 14 months, Chicago Nursing Home Search, the app that was launched two winters ago in a dark corner over there in an abandoned portion of the building is now ready to go live. And my favorite thing about this is everyone who's never been here before is like, who is this clown? <laughs> All right. So it started out with a story in the New York Times about how the uh, rating system used by nursing homes was uh, not reflective of the reality. There were homes that were rated really well that had some really horrific problems. And so it began with a New York Times story and then a TED. TED is no longer here, but TED was the guy that came up with the idea. And uh, I tagged along a few weeks later, and uh, we got this thing going. So then, uh, our objective was to create a better rating system. So uh, we built a really complicated website with the, uh, the back end, and a lot of, uh, it took a whole lot of work to do anything. But um, we, it didn't really take off. So after a couple months, one person and another person it moved on to other things, and uh, the A team disbanded. So B-list guy <laughs> took a long weekend and actually used a system developed by uh, Derek to uh, just throw up a quick map that displayed the ratings of nursing homes already, already available on the Medicare website. And um, then lo and behold, people were interested again. So then we got a second wind and then we built a site with no back end because uh, the, all the work we were putting into the database uh, was really distracting and it was hard to find a database person who would consistently volunteer. So we just built a site that pulls data directly from uh, data.medicare.gov. And you can too, and I can teach you how. <laughs> so where do we, uh, what's out there, right? We have data.medicare.gov. Uh-oh, what have I done? How does the mouse work? Here we go. So they have Nursing Home Compare. So you plug in your uh, zip code. Am I in there? And it gives you this, which is a list of uh, nursing homes and five-star ratings on several different categories. And there's a lot of good info here, but you can't really see a bigger picture. Also, there's... Uh, it doesn't give you much of an understanding of what's going on. So if you go to the map view they created, it gives you just a little handful of nursing homes. And you um, have to click into each one to see what's, which one's better than the others. So anyway, I am not going to show it because that goes terribly wrong. But there is a uh, Cal Quality Care group. So they have a very in-depth app that has a better rating system, and it gives you a visual of all the nursing homes in your general area in uh, California. And uh, it only costs them a million and a half dollars a year. <laughs> Our budget being significantly less than that, we created instead this. I am going to click on it. It's alive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, well, our initial plan was focused on the ratings, but what we saw when you put it on a map is that uh, there's a lot of red, right? So the red dots represent nursing homes with the lowest possible rating from uh, Medicare, and the green dots are the highest. And you'll notice there are some really high concentrations right there, right? And what's going on with some of these places? So if you click on one, uh, let's pick a bad one. There we go. You get... Uh, this little data card that shows you is a one. Um, they're bad on when the state comes to inspect. They have a lot of problems. Their staffing is low and their nursing level is low. And then recently we have added a whole new detail view so you can uh, see all kinds of stuff about this place. And we'll talk about some more of these issues later, but are they administering antipsychotic medications to residents who don't need antipsychotic medications? Residents who are just having a hard time or they're excited? Um, we have explanations for all the ratings, and this stuff I pulled directly from Medicare. So again, team no back end, right? We've got the information about the owners, and we've got all their latest efficiencies, which is pulled directly uh, from Medicare. Can I just jump in here to talk about Absolutely. why they use antipsychotics? It's because physical restraints are now mostly illegal. 
So places that use, see this is another metric that gets a little tricky, but often a heavy use of antipsychotic medication can be indicative of what they call a chemical restraint. Um, but some facilities have large, like Jerry psychiatric patients when they might be using those for the right reasons. So anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, 2.0, we may talk about later, but I'm going to keep coming to Hack Night. You can't get rid of me. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about the situation before I hand it over to someone who actually knows something about this. Um, <laughs> Illinois ranks near the bottom na nationally for nursing home quality. We're 44 out of 50, at least according to this one group, Families for Better Care. Um, and so some of the things they talked about uh, were the, uh, what they believe may be excessive use of uh, strong medications. So a lot of these places are understaffed and um, they find deficiencies commonly, which can be like a fire code violation or a health inspection violation. Um, so back in 2009, 2010, Chicago Tribune did a really fascinating series on all the problems with uh, nursing homes. They found that uh, in 2006, the state had stopped um, keeping up with uh, like, um, I think criminal background checks or like whether or not there were uh, registered sex offenders in the nursing homes. Um, coupled with the closing of a lot of mental health facilities, uh, younger people who um, have, uh, I mean, they can be quite strong, but they have a mental health problem or something like that, also ended up in nursing homes with people who are not so strong, which by itself can create a very dangerous situation. Um, and they found a variety of other issues, but I am sticking to my time. So this link is live, and I suggest you go check out that series. So then Governor Pat Quinn and the state uh, legislature decided they wanted to do something about it. So they passed the Long-Term Care Reform Bill, which had a lot of great stuff in there. And um, it's my general understanding that things are, much, are better since then. However, funding uh, has been a huge problem. Uh, it, part of, to get the uh, little temporary sort of kind of budget from the state, they had a $106 million cut from uh, Medicaid. Um, so you may end up in a nursing home short term on Medicare, but if you need to be there long term and you don't have much money, you're going to be there on Medicaid. And um, so a cut to Medicaid um, has a real effect on nursing homes and it may have an effect on the quality of life of anyone who's living there. Um, and you may not think you're poor, but uh, at $190 a day, your life savings will deplete pretty quickly and uh, you can find yourself on Medicaid. So now I'm going to hand it over to Jason. Hi, everybody. Um, so thanks, uh, Joel. And I've started showing my colleagues the Chicago Nursing Home uh, Search website. And it's been really, really well received, actually, more than I even thought it would be. And I think part of the reason that that's happening is that if you think about the people who are going to be using it, it's going to be families in crisis. It's going to be discharge planners, social workers, people like that. Um, and what they need is information fast. And what I think is really cool about the, uh, the nursing home website is that, I don't know if you showed when you did show when you click, but you can quickly find out what nursing homes are in your neighborhood. That five-star CMS rating doesn't tell you everything you need to know. You still need to, should visit the facility. Um, but it can maybe quickly help you identify what might be convenient and get you started. And then if you click, you can see a tremendous amount of detail, but it's fairly well organized. And that's detail that I, it is available through CMS, but I think it's hard to get um, short of downloading CSV files and starting to dig around in there, which uh, families are not going to be doing. So I'm really optimistic about this. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the project, um, or start talking about the project that we're currently um, kicking off, it's our first year at the University of Chicago, using um, some federal funding to address older adult health at a population level, specifically on the south side of Chicago. So I think um, pretty much everybody has at least some um, familiarity with the changing uh, age-related demographics in the United States. Um, there's lots of different ways to show it with data and anecdote, um, but this chart here Basically, the red line is the 65 plus population. Um, and then I put Florida right at the 20% mark because Florida's uh, 65 plus population right now is at about 20%. So by the year 2030 to 2035, the entire United States population, demographically speaking, break, broken down by age, is going to look like Florida does now, if you've ever been there. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's. 
our society is going to transform radically, I, I hope for the better, at least in, in a way that's more accommodating. But my feeling is that um, the baby boomer generation that's coming is going to transform healthcare, retirement, um, community in the way that it's transformed education and civic activism and things like that in the past. Um, so we do have a big problem, though, that our healthcare workforce is woefully unprepared for the current uh, older adult population, much less the one that's coming. And um, the profession that I'm going to focus a little bit about on this talk is geriatricians. These are MDs who have done a one to two year fellowship um, following their residency and who have specialized training in how to care for older adults. Um, right now, there's uh, about 40, uh, for, what is it, 4,700 geriatricians in the United States and we have 155 in training. That's to take care of a population of 46 million. Um, and it's actually uh, falling rather steeply. So what my project is trying to do is to take the specialized knowledge that r these folks have um, and use that to educate the entire um, healthcare, primary, particularly primary care workforce on the south side of Chicago. Um, and just a, s a couple other stats here. There's very little training for regular MDs. I mean, they get about nine and a half hours throughout the entire course of their medical education in working with, uh, with older adults. This problem is systemic. It goes all the way down to like clinical trials, for example, typically don't include older adults in the sample size. So it's a huge problem. But um, anyway. OK. So I wanted to look a little bit closer here at the south side population because um, there are sort of specific set of circumstances. Uh, there are more older adults on the south side, they tend to have less access to health care. Um, they're more living in poverty. And actually, um, as an example of the metric that illustrates the lower access to health care, we've got half as many primary care providers per uh, 1,000 residents, um, underinsured and so on. Now, that being said, the community offers tremendous assets for sort of getting information out there. Um, robust, tight family networks, uh, communities of faith, block clubs, and so on. Um, and so that's why we took the approach that we did, which was to uh, network with both community-based organizations and um, sort of community-based health organizations and long-term care. Um, Symphony Post-Acute Network is a partner of ours. And actually, you can see the S's there. They have something like 20 facilities across Chicago. Um, but those are just the ones that we're, we're working for um, in terms of educating the long-term care uh, workforce in geriatric uh, best practices. Um, basically, if I go here forward a little bit, I um, thought a lot about how to organize this um, just to sort of, we have like a many, many initiatives kind of going on in this share network umbrella. Um, but I broke it down here by the folks that we're trying to educate. But really, the two main arms are working to educate the medical workforce, again, in geriatric best practices, and also working to educate older adults themselves, families, caregivers, in, um, in their own health, um, in health literacy. So we do a lot. Um, we do like three to five, I have up there, events per month across the south side. Um, and a lot within the traditional medical training. And then also, given the focus here on technology, I thought I would talk a little bit about this uh, Project ECHO, which you see in the middle column. What this does, um, it's actually a model that comes out of New Mexico, where they had a severe hepatitis outbreak that overwhelmed all this sort of far-flung network of family care practices. Um, and so what they did is they switched, instead of having everybody go to see your specialist, like we could not possibly sustain with all these older adults coming to see the 10 geriatricians at the University of Chicago, um, we are, this video conferencing based model uses, uh, creates sort of small groups of primary care doctors and what we call interdisciplinary, so nurses, um, social workers, whoa, um, <laughs> and so on. I call it the Brady Bunch, but basically you get everybody together on a video conference here. And then instead of just a straight uh, medical lecture where you have to bring all these people to the University of Chicago, provide them with food and parking and you know, travel and a lot of time out of the clinic, we can just do all this sort of virtually. Um, and this model is actually being used across the city in a variety of disease areas, but now we're doing it here um, 
in geriatrics. And what you kind of can't see here is a case example. So one of these physicians has provided a complex case stripped of personal health information, um, and then the entire group will collaborate around it. Um, and anyway, it's, so far it's been quite successful. But this is how we kind of think of it as like a force multiplier, part of the way that we're trying to educate an entire you know, um, segment of the workforce with only a handful of providers. So the last thing I'd talk a little bit about here is we have sort of a, we're piloting like, let's say, a larger intervention that's frankly not scalable um, with one particular nursing home on the south side. This one's actually rated at a three, um, so about the middle of the road. And you know the other thing that I thought about was they're, they're at three stars when it comes to staffing, too. Um, and they are staffed so lean, like unbelievable. You people are working, you know, at a running pace from when they walk in to when they leave. Um, we've had to redesign our whole curriculum because there's, people have no opportunity to participate in any kind of training, even for like 15 minutes, the way we were doing it. So if that's staffing at three stars, I'm wondering what staffing at one star means. I mean, um, anyways, that's a little bit scary. Um, but anyway, the workforce within this particular nursing home that we're working with the most is the aides, the CNAs. Um, this place employs around 130 of them. And it's been interesting to sort of understand how the working conditions of the CNA translate as well as they do to a lot of the quality problems that are happening at the nursing home and frankly why they can be so difficult to reform. Again, it's, a, it's an extremely physical um, and emotionally taxing job. It pays the minimum wage. Um, it's not a position that requires, technically it re requires 40 hours of training. Frankly, people are um, doing it with a lot less, maybe eight hours of sort of cursory training. And yet those aides are the ones who spend the most time face-to-face -face with residents of any medical provider in the entire system. Yet they have a day's training. Um, and and they, it's not a, generally not a culture that sort of respects what they do. So one of the things that we've been able to do that I'm really proud of, that's actually Monica, our nurse educator, is to at least for this facility, see if we come in with a huge, uh, a large emphasis on getting training for the CNAs, for sort of the base level workforce within a nursing home. If we can, if we can sort of take what would be just a job and instead make it into a springboard for a career um, in, in healthcare, when we provide them with a, a UFC branded certificate, which we hope will help them land, you know, the jobs that they choose moving on. And so far, we've had some successes. We've only been at it for about six months now, so I don't have uh, big data set to point to. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, so some other challenges. Um, I'd heard this anecdotally, I haven't heard it back, you know, really rigorously backed up, but the nursing home industry does not suffer from lack of a regulation at all. In fact, the, the anecdote that I want to mention is that it's often said that the only industry that has more regulation than the nursing home is the aviation industry. In fact, there's in some ways so much that it actually makes the operation of a nursing home much more, in some ways a lot more difficult because they're having so many surprise inspections. Every, I don't know if you noticed when Joel had brought up uh, a nursing home here, but it has, most of them have this long list of all these things they've been fined or penalized for. Each one of those means another inspection coming in. So frankly, it adds to sort of a chaotic environment in a nursing home. Um, but anyway, I'm pleased that we've been able to do what we do. If we can see some real um, uh, improvements, particularly in what I'm thinking about here when I say difficult to measure is with patient outcomes and patient health, how we can you know, improve workforce education and see some sort of biometric indicator with a patient, it's very difficult to do. But if we can, then we'll sort of continue to scale out our model across the south side, um, particularly using the network of nursing homes that I mentioned and you saw in the first slide. So that's about what I have about the SHARE network for right now. But um, I'm really happy to see everybody here and so passionate about nursing homes. Um, and um, the thing that I like to kind of reflect about and the reason why I do this, I'm a social worker by training, um, but my, 
I think that it's important to remember that we're all going to be fortunate enough to age, right? So the society and that we build through various aspects, you know, urban planning and um, healthcare reform and everything else, the, the society that we build for older adults will be the society that we all enter into, for better or worse, as older adults. So I would just leave that with you as a perhaps a source of inspiration to uh, think about how to engage with this particular population. So. All right. Oh, can everybody who worked on the nursing home app stand up? Hooray! <laughs> I had to do it. All right. No, um, because there's several, um, I hadn't thought about that. It would be great if it could, but you got to keep in mind that that five-star rating is blended from several um, aspects, you know, infection control, um, and staffing is the big one, right? And that's what makes me think it's going to be most limited. Um, we would love to have more staff available to, you know, to reduce that ratio, but you got to keep in mind, most, one of the trends within the nursing home industry is that it's being bought into by private equity. Um, many, many nursing homes now are being bought by these conglomerates. And so how do you move up a staffing ratio with an organization where um, the business model is, you know, predicated on large profit margins? Um, you know, that's sort of why I was marveling in a or maybe we're horrified to think about what some of the staffing ratios may be like um, in some of these other facilities. Up here, it's like 30, 30 to 1, 30 to 40 to 1, um, nurse to resident. Yeah. I think we had a question from Steve. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, from Steve. Uh, I found out the hard way last year that people with disabilities after a hospital stay go to nursing homes until they recover enough, so it's not just the older generation. Right, and a lot of these nursing homes too are also now rehab centers. Um, so that means um, you've got a, a sort of younger population who's coming in and out in addition to uh, the long-term nursing home residents who tend to be older. Um, that's actually been the source of a lot of exploitation that's happened of people in nursing homes too, have been from younger, uh, healthier patients. Sure. Yeah. There's one I really like right here, not in Chicago, unfortunately, mostly due to um, zoning. Um, but um, and I can explain why. But it's called the greenhouse model. So it'd be worth um, googling. But what that tries to do is switch the facility, it does a lot, but switch the facility from medical model to residential model. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of really strange sort of and sad power dynamics that go on in the nursing home. Um, for example, you don't have control over what you eat or when you eat or even whether or not your door is locked. So the greenhouse model kind of takes that and flips it on its head, making it m into more of a home and restoring the um, resident to being the main decision maker. Um, it will also will pair uh, aids with individual residents over a long term. That's one thing that most nursing homes don't do. It'll be like a new face um, constantly for residents. So that would be one model I would look to as uh, progressive in the right way. And I would just add, if you're interested in that, on the About page of the nursing home site, we have some links out to other groups. And the Illinois Pioneer Coalition is doing a lot yeah, of work on exactly. that. exactly. Has there been any uh, feedback from like, the nursing home industry to like, raise visibility on these core ratings and stuff? Has anyone, like, have they responded to uh, They have lobbyists. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for legitimate reason, I mean, the, uh, they do have interests, and uh, sometimes those interests coincide with the interests of the residents. Um, but I've not seen any particular feedback on this other than, um, I think I've had a couple of, uh, so I, when I started the, my project, which is, uh, assuming they've seen it, is, uh, that's a pretty bold, <laughs> un unlikely assertion. But uh, 
um, I had some feedback, like a little bit for people who said they wanted to talk to me, but then I never heard back from them. That's, that's the extent of it. I could add one thing to that. Yeah. One really um, wonderful thing that's happened or is happening right now is that it, for the longest time, and I believe still is currently, that when somebody's entering a nursing home and they're signing over their documents as they come in, they're actually also signing over their right to sue uh, the nursing home. And it's, I forget the name for it, basically it forced arbitration or something like that. So if somebody wanted to um, sue the nursing home, they would be legally unable to do so at pretty much every nursing home there is. Um, so that's being undone. So that, you know, should there be the need to, um, patients or their family can pursue a broader range of legal options. Uh, one of the things I've seen, at least as like a former monastery teaching assistant, is that you know, there are limits on how many students or children can be with a teacher plus an assistant. Or some, uh, there's, there's like regulations around that, and they can't break them or they'll shut the centers down. Um, is that leverage that anyone's like tried to apply in this situation? Because, I mean, part of, I guess, the private equity drive is to like drive down labor costs, and this is detrimental to the patients. Yeah, certainly. Um, the situ so there are, you know, nurse to, um, nurse to resident, nurse to patient ratios. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm honestly not sure quite what they are. I know there's legal limits, but they must be pretty darn um, low. I mean, it, um, so, yeah, and um, those ratios actually play into why. Something like the Greenhouse Project and the, the, the Pioneer Network is the sort of the founder of that has had a lot of trouble in this area. And the reason why I said it had to do with zoning was because, the, again, the greenhouse model is highly residential. And they actually, they, it's designed from the ground up to, be, to, to, to have fidelity with this particular model. And that means little houses. But the problem is then you have to have way more nursing staff because of those um, staff to resident ratios. So if you, in this one building, you might have to have a minimum of how many ever nurses. Well, that's fine if you've got 200 residents, you can keep it low. But if you've got 12 residents, that becomes more problematic, and that's why it ties back to zoning. Does that make sense? Are you talking about city districts? City and suburbs, yeah. Is there uh, oversight built into these Medicaid evaluations from the federal government? Or, I mean, what, is there anything done at the federal level, or who's supposed to be, is the, what, what inspections regime exists? There's a few different um, bodies that'll come in. The Illinois um, Department of Health, uh, there, so there's several regulatory bodies that are looking at nursing homes, um, and I'm frankly not an expert in all of them. I know the Department of Health is one. Um, there's, there's like the Department of Health facilities. Somebody here might know more about that than I. Um, Department of Aging? Right, the Department of Aging also has oversight. There's the Ombudsman, who's a sort of advocate for people who are, who are um, unable to resolve their issues with the nursing home, who can also come in for surprise inspections. Um, and, and I mean, there's just, um, again, CMS is providing, is taking in these metrics, that Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, and I would say giving the most oversight at the federal level, if that, if that answers your question. They're not helping to make the situation better as far as we can tell with these inspections? They are, yeah. I just, my point would be that with our particular nursing home that we were focusing on, when, you know, we set aside entire days for staff training and then, you know, maybe we do that every other, uh, every week for a month, and then we can't do, you know, two of those days because of state inspectors coming in again and again. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it sort of is, turns into a vicious cycle because this, they're already staffed so lean. Other questions? Um, <clears throat> so now you've made this website and it's beautiful, uh, fantastic typography choices, by the way. Um, is there like sort of a plan or thought for promoting and marketing and trying to get like uh, the website in the hands of the people who need it most who maybe maybe not reach through like word of mouth or through circles from from y'all? Yeah. Oh. Phase two. 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, tonight I'm hoping to get some social media interest going, and I think the Cook County Record is Chronicle is Chronicle is going to run a story on this, and um, I'm hoping to build some momentum that way, and then I'm hoping to come up with a low-cost guerrilla marketing strategy, um, which uh, I'll give you a little sneak preview you might hear about in the breakout session call. Awesome. Other questions? Do we want to? Oh. So are there external reasons for why there's such a shortage of geriatric medical professionals? Yes. Um, the, the, let's say we're talking about geriatricians, so MDs for right now. Um, they're paid markedly lower than other specialties. And the thing that really um, brought that home to me and made me wonder why anybody would do it is because I realized that if, so I mentioned there's a one to two year fellowship to become a geriatrician. If they stopped and didn't do any fellowship at all, they'd actually be making more money than if they took that time out from, you know, um, from a, a, a lucrative segment of their um, career to do the fellowship. It's pretty amazing. It's be mostly because they're getting paid primarily through Medicare, or excuse me, through, um, uh, yeah, through Medicare reimbursements, which are lower on average than private pay. Plus there's stigma, which is a little bit higher, you know, harder to nail down exactly, but I think is very real. So I was wondering the ACO model, you mentioned the extended uh, community health outcome model. Like, did you actually have help, uh, like social workers to go to the local community to do the outreach? And were those like local clinicians engaged in this model? Well, we're not, we don't have very many people actually traveling anywhere. That's kind of the beauty of it. Um, so basically, there's actually a whole sort of little mini office at the University of Chicago Hospital that runs this um, ECHO program. And they have coordinators and stuff who do um, outreach to various organizations. Like we work a lot with federally qualified health centers, um, with an organization that's kind of up and coming called Oak Street Health with, in our case, St. Bernard Hospital um, and these symphony locations. So there isn't much sort of on the ground um, recruitment, um, but we haven't needed to do a whole lot. The, the model's been fairly successful and we've actually got more people who are asking to participate. We kind of have a wait list right now. They yeah, they found us. Um, there's definitely recruitment that goes on, but it's n it, we're not you know, uh, struggling to find people. All right, let's give a hand to our presenters.